Hey people, it's Archmomp here and welcome to the second bonus episode of Daganrampa 2. Last time we started off the Daganrampa If novel, which turns out apparently Muku Makoto was the first person to ever smile at Mukuro and apparently she's a, she has security issues. Why? But anyways, let's just get back to this. It was a strange feeling to Mukuro. It was like Zar Thwomp had yet set the timer for this video, and he had yet set everything in order. To Mukuro, it was like she was standing on the ledge of a tall building, imagine what would happen if she jumped. A destructive feeling, akin to holding a friend's baby and wondering what would happen if you tripped and fell. Before she knew it, a fear and anxiety had suddenly taken control of Mukuro's heart. A member of Fenrir. And as an ultimate despair, Mukuro had killed innumerable people. She had handled live grenades before. She had descended from the sky in a parachute as anti-aircraft weapon refired all around her. Her heart never wavered on the battlefield, but now it felt like she could collapse any second. Monokuma, however, was as stable as a tree, and it slightly tilted his head to the side. Huh? Won't you listen to my story? I'm not the one who's killed kill Makoto. You are! What, what are you saying, Junko? Monokuma began giving a strange explanation to a very confused Mukuro. Do you know what the suspension bridge effect really means? It means you push the person you love off a bridge, and they'll be yours for eternity. I, I haven't heard that at all. Life has always followed what your textbooks say. It's sad, but that's what you love, is it? But that's what love is? His words made no sense, and Mukuro couldn't think of anything to say as she stood there dumbfounded. Meanwhile, Monokuma continued at his little speech, intentionally saying things meant to antagonize Mukuro. Basically, this is your big chance, you know. If you kill Makoto right here and now, nobody will ever take him away from you again. Makoto Nayegi, dead by dawn. The last name he, the last name he ever spoke was Mukuro Ikusaba. The last person he ever smiled at was Mukuro Ikusaba. Doesn't that sound wonderful? There was a certain appeal to Monokuma's twisted suggestion, and then Mukuro found herself unsure of her own judgment. This is wrong. It has to be wrong. But it's really Junko saying all this. That doesn't mean it's right. Now, this isn't Junko, it's Monokuma. Monokuma, 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 Monokuma. And are you sure you want to help Makoto? Once he gets better, he's gonna know everything. He'll know what you did to your classmates. I can't believe you would actually erase your friends' memories on their time together and force them to kill each other. Makoto might get mad and say, Our real enemy is the bear, it's her! Do you really want to blame me for this? I. Mukuro's face turned pale. <laughs> Are you gonna kill the others? If everyone expects you and Makoto dies, you'll be able to spend the rest of your lives in school together. We can't hold class trials with only two people. It might be a good idea for both to, to live the rest of your lives here at this academy forever. No, that's wrong, I. And what are you gonna do if his memories return? It's not like you were dating Makoto or anything. You were just watching him from afar the whole time. So what? Mukuro, did she have feelings for Makoto? Oh my gosh, that first pre time event when she was like, I need to, s I'll set you up with a friend, was Mukuro referring to herself? Oh my gosh, that's sad! Mukuro was posing as her sister and trying to set Makoto up on a blind date with herself. Oh my gosh! Man, you're so shy! You can shoot people's hearts and brains around, but you can't even woo some stupid boy into liking you! Do you want to know who Makoto had a crush on before his memories were taken away? <laughs> ah, ah! Mukuro trembled as Makoto Monokuma continued pressing the issue, gradually loosening the screws, keeping her heart secure. So Mukuro chose to pretend she didn't hear anything at all. All emotion vanished from her face, and she looked silently from Makoto's e handbook. If you're looking for his blood type, it's not written in his e handbook! Mukuro's face turned pale. Within five seconds, her plan to ignore Monokuma had already failed. But since you're the headmaster, but since your headmaster is made up of 50% kin kindness, I'll tell you anyways. Makoto's blood type is B. As soon as she heard him say that, all the anxiety for her hustling mouth and red turning turn with him Mukuro had completely vanished. Well, thank you, Junko. Mukuro sparkled without a hint of suspicion, so she turned her back to Monokuma without a hint of suspicion, and I walked towards the bridge containing the blood packs. Fresh blood packs should have been prepared before the plane took effect. They'll last in cold storage for 21 days. They should still be good. Despite her emotionless face, Mukuro let herself feel a small amount of satisfaction to took a blood pack from the bridge. As Monokuma watched her, his, his normally emotionless eyes switched ever so slightly. 
If a third party could see his face right now, or even if the other students could see his face right now, they'd wonder, is Monokuma surprised? That's right, they'd have the same shocked look on their face as if they were seeing Monokuma for the first time. At that moment, a whisper crept out of Monokuma's emotional face. There should be a limit of how disappointing you can be. There was a fuck. It was far quieter than Mosquito's wings. Even with her battle-hardened hearing, Yukuro couldn't hear what he said. Monokuma shook his head, and the voice returned to normal. It's not like I care that you, the ultimate despair, was hoping anything. It's not like I expected much from you to begin with, so this will always help me feel despair. But seriously, you disappoint me. Because, you know, despair and disappointment are completely different things, okay? They are as different as bears and pandas. What are you? Mukuru's eyes started to shake as she turned back to uh, Monokuma. She hadn't started talking any differently than usual. Mukuru had turned off the voice modulator and started talking in a real voice or anything. And yet, Mukuru was utterly terrified. She was terrified on instinct. Not as a soldier. Half of she was terrified because of her instincts as the ultimate despair. And the other half was because she was Shunko's older sister. Even though M Monokuma, her instincts, you think Monokuma, her instincts were telling her that Junko was annoyed with her. Technically, Junko is annoyed with virtually everyone. Junko, why are you annoyed? I is it because I betrayed you? Or is it because I didn't die like you wanted me to? Ugh! Sucked Monokuma. I'm, an I'm beyond annoyed! I'm really, really angry! I'm really, really disappointed right now! I'm so pissed I can take a rage nap right now! Monokuma's anger didn't seem any different from his usual anger towards the student. Mugro could instinctively sense another emotion mixed in it. Right now, she could feel it. Junko was feeling hopeless disappointment. It's normal for someone who's disappointed to lose hope, but for ultimate despair, disappointment means something else entirely. Damn, disappointment was tantamount to losing despair itself. Mukuro was a member of ultimate despair. At her sister's behest, Mukuro had soiled her hands many times in order to fill the world with despair. Despite her pride towards being a member of the ultimate despair, there was a certain feeling difference between Mukuro and her sister. Junko Enoshima was despair incarnate. She was born in despair, letting it infect other people's hopes so it could rot them from the inside out, twisting them into her own image. For Junko, feeling hope was its own despair. Creating despair in others created despair in herself, which caused her to feel both intense pain and intense bliss. Junko had walked the fracture to create from this conflict between pleasure and pain, and it saw her life. Eventually, the fracture would widen until it swallowed the world and tore itself in half. But Mukuro, on the other hand, had neither hope nor despair for the world. At least, not when she was a member of Fenrir. Ever since she was a child, Mugro believed she was meant to spread despair because of her sister. She didn't harbor any ill will towards the world. She simply accepted she was meant to spread despair, and chose to walk the same path as her sister. She doubted she was, she felt was only reason, was a recent development. Okay, we're still recording, but just make sure. When Junko told her about her plan, when she watched the world burn at the hands of terrorists wearing Monokuma masks, she never wavered once. However, as soon as she heard about her sister's plan to make her classmates kill each other, M Makoto included, a strange feeling began to stir within her. What started as a seed of doubt soon grew into a thorny vine and staring Mukuro's feet. As soon as she disguised herself as Junko and finished meeting the other students, as soon as she confirmed that everyone's memories had been completely taken away, that vine began tightening around Mukuro's heart. They're gone. Junko's the only one who knows about me now. That's it. But there's no problem. It's just like old times. Things will never go back to how they used to be, but that's fine. This should be fine. She had relinquished the past two, past two years she had spent with her friends so she could betray them, deliver death and despair unto them. Though her heart ached, Mukuro was beyond feeling guilt or remorse for her actions. But the question, why does my heart ache like this, still remained unanswered. Perhaps that's why she spent so much time talking to Makoto when he was in the nurse's office. And when Makoto gave her that one particular answer, something changed inside her. In return, I promise that if I do decide to kill someone, it won't be you. The words Mukuro blurted out to Makoto weren't improvised to further her role as Junko. It was an honest sentiment from the bottom of her heart. She was even claimed to ask Junko herself if Makoto could somehow be spared from their plan. Over the past few years, Mukuro's interest had been slowly shifting away from her sister and towards the world itself. By extension, her interests also include Makoto, the first person to ever smile at her and make her feel connected to the world. He was like a sapling of pure honesty that had taken root in Mukuro's heart. By the time she realized that, the tree had already rocked. As Mukuro struggled to understand the situation, Monokuma laughed aside and said, I wonder which part of you is a wolf anyways! You're just a dog that blindly follows Junko's orders! What does that tattoo on your hand even mean? Are you just a bitch who pledged your loyalty to her owners? Sorry if I cussed. I bet Toko would say that! I'm positive! <laughs> Junko knows Toko too well! 
Not according to Zenith Talk is Mukuro still in confusion. I was obviously lying when I I was obviously lying when I said Makoto's blood type is B! What? Hi Mukuro, Mukuro. you lied, Chunko! A normal person would have been suspicious. A normal person was suspicious! I never thought you'd actually believe me just now! I must have misplaced my eyes because I totally did not see that coming! Not even with my ability to predict the future! How shocking! Keith, I'm about to start crying my eyes out like some sort of robot cat! Seriously! It it's going to be okay, Junko, said Mugro. I know our playing hot fell, but I'm still on your side. Are you feeling alright? Because I I'll do anything! Snap! Our sh sound came from Monaco's mouth. That sound was one of my circuits overloading! It's been so long since I felt this angry! Me meet me on the school room of the school! I'll smash on all your baby teeth! Monokuma st uh, sh startled sh started eh. Monokuma started shadow boxing from Mukuro, who remained frozen in place, clutching a blood pack in her hand. She still looked confused, and Monokuma threw up her, uh, his arms in frustration. You're so disappointed, I can't even predict it anymore! Arr! A threatening roar burst from Monokuma's mouth as he left that Mukuro with his sharp claws extended. In that moment, her face became completely emotionless. It was not conscious action. The defensive instinct she honed during her time with Mario temporarily suppressed her emotions as she turned to Monokuma's attack. Mukuro grabbed a nearby IV stand and used it to parry Monokuma's claws. However, Monokuma's claws seemed to be made place with a special ally. He easily slices the bar in half gap badly. But instead of following up his attack, Monokuma continued talking to Mukuro. I guess you're not much of a disappointment when it comes to fighting. In fact, if you were so pathetic that you died from that single attack, that would have been interesting in its own way. But right now, you're just incompetent at everything. I I'm, I I'm sorry, said Mukuro. I couldn't help blocking your attack. But there's no way I can fight you, Junko. I'm all, I need all you have. Uh, Junko has her despair. I'm, I'm the only one who understands you at all. Mukuro's words were real with endless dismay. The contrast between her usual stoic self and the way she was acting now was so stark. He might assume she had multiple personalities. However, Monica would just quietly stare at her. He was perfectly still, as if all his functions had powered down completely. But Mukuro continued to share her feelings. There's no way I could just leave you alone. And then Monica broke his silence. But. At that moment, a monitor in the nurse's office lit up, displaying a girl's face, Junko and Hiroshima. At the same time, a voice completely unlike Monokuma's began to play from the speakers. Oh, this is going to be real special. Because... I never had to voice Junko and Mukuro at the same time. Hey, Mukuro. J Junko? It had been several days since Mukuro had heard her sister's real voice. Though her face remained emotionless, excitement sparkled in her eyes. However, that shine mutely dulled. I'm grateful to you, Mukuro. I mean it. Junko's voice emanated from the speaker, sounded very gentle and kind. Junko. I'm really sorry. I said so many mean things to you. I even tried to kill you earlier. And I was about to make you do something horrible just now. Even though I know about your feelings towards Makoto. I, I don't, I, I don't. You have to force yourself, even if you don't notice. I was totally obvious to anyone looking at you. You never cared about the class photos. But when but Makoto said he was going to take one, he made sure you were facing the camera. Oh my gosh! Is that why the oh, oh my gosh? So that photo that Makoto received that he was taken out of, it wasn't that he was to leave from it, he was taking the picture. And that's the one Mukuro was staring directly at. And now that I think about it, in Hina's class photo, I believe, yeah, in Hina's class photo, it was one where... Yeah, it was Hina's class photo. It was the one where basically they were in the classroom and sitting at the desks. That explains why Mukuro was just staring intently at the back of Makoto's head. And then Junko and Ash you know, the ultimate despair, flashed a smile, a pure sweet smile. On the monitor, she looked like a normal high school girl teasing her older sister, and yet Mukuro could feel despair and anxiety encasing themselves around her. I always thought you should have tried hard to make pictures with Makoto. But I guess that's what makes you so disappointing. Still, even though you're disappointing and annoying, I still love you. Mukuro trembled upon hearing those words. I love you. That's all she ever wanted to hear her sister say. Mukuro believed, no matter what Junko said, she believed she really loved her. She believed she was the only one who could truly understand the despair known as Junko and Oshima. She was naive. As soon as she heard Junko say, I love you, Mukuro realized she never completely understood her sister. It was only at this moment that Mukuro finally understood her sister's feelings. Junko's words right now were kind. Perhaps that kindness was completely honest. The words, I love you, might have been true as well. However, for Junko and Yoshima, this was her way of saying goodbye. She was severing the ties between them. It was painfully clear to Mukuro. And then, 
before she eats anything, the girl in the mirror made a remark that cut Luke Rowe to the bone. I'm sure someday you'll make I'm sure someday you'll make your dreams come true. Ultimate despair is ultimate despair is never talk to each other like this. A simple truth stabbed in Luke's heart. Luke had no further use for her. Her own sister was trying ways with her. Luke had dedicated over ten years of her life to the cause of ultimate despair, and at this moment, it all came from nothing. But those years no longer mattered to Mukro. Her sister's rejection was more than enough to send her into the depths of despair. That's why Mugro, even now, clung to a small sliver of hope. Meanwhile, Junko was still on the monitor. Yeah, right. Did you really think I'd say something that nice? You're so an you're so annoying. Can't you just hurry up and disappear already? Mugro up Junko would say something like that. She hoped that she'd start verbally abusing her again or call her useless and incompetent. Mugro was no masochist, but she preferred to shout with bullets and contempt than endure this kind of emotional pain. But I love you, Mugro. Bye-bye! The mire went black, leaving Mukuro to proceed, process the horrible goodbye she had just received. And, his, and as if on cue, Monokuma started moving again. Isn't family love so nice? By the way, did you know that in about half an uh, about half of all murder cases, the killer is a family member? Monokuma spoke in his usual tone of voice, but it was unclear if his words were getting through to Mukuro. Mukuro let uh, the blood pack in her hand fall to the floor and tightened her grip on the iron bar she was holding. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Junko, I, I'm sorry. So I'm sorry. She mumbled quietly as if she was chanting a spell and walked past the blood on the floor to Makoto's bedside where the iron bars are in. Oh my gosh! I was a fool! Why did I make it where I did the dates with Kyoko? Makoto and Mugro, they're the true chef! Freaking... I'll do it properly. I'm gonna try to do it. No, don't kill Makoto! So, so... Oh, said Monokuma perking up. What are you gonna do? Properly do to Makoto what that thick, big, thick rod you got there? Are you gonna do him? Are you gonna do him, do him? Are you gonna do him in? Either way, I started to feel some heart throwing excitement! Mukuro looked like she had been completely broken. Monokuma walked close to her with eager anticipation. Suddenly, Monokuma's body silently floated into the air. Huh? With no expression on his face, Monokuma tried to see what had just happened to him. And in the blink of an eye, an iron bar ripped through his body. The tip of the bar, which had been cut diagonally early by the sharp point, went straight through the Monokuma and stabbed into a surveillance camera. The lens was completely destroyed, and the camera shot out sparks as it broke down. The iron bar was still stabbed into the surveillance camera, as Monokuma dangled on the other end. He opened his mouth as if to say something, but only stat came out. A few games later, this functions came to a complete stop. Without making a sound at all, Mukuro had kicked Monokuma into the air. The two Monokuma's power source and his bottom circuit perfectly aligned with the surveillance camera and their self. Mukuro plunged the iron bar into all three of them. No human being has the skill to utilize such a technique. Not even an ultimate. All the hesitation within Mukuro had vanished. Her eyes sparked with a panther stalking its prey at night. A tense aura surrounded Mukuro, even more so than when she fought Sakura earlier. Ignoring Monokuma's lifeless form, she looked at Makoto as she breathed softly and remembered her sister's parting words. So this is despair. She mumbled to herself. I'm sorry, Junko. I never really understood what despair was. She spoke without emotion, like a machine. But it's going to be alright now. I finally understand. Then within her, passions began to stir. So, I'll make sure I make you happy, Junko. I'll make sure I fill you with despair. Ooh, so is Mukuro gonna kill Junko? I'll save Makoto. I'll make sure the others don't die. I'll let them escape from this place. I feel with the people on the outside, too. You invested so much time and killed so many people for the sake of this plan. And then basically, oh my god, she exits that building. And then she's gonna find Teru Teru. Just standing out there like his, as the ultimate spirit. Why, hello? Why, hello there, Mukuro. Why, have ultimate despair, Romp? And I'll destroy every last remnant of it for you. This was not an act of revenge toward the sister who had abandoned her. This was an act of mercy. Struck between the altar despair and the alt and the hope she gained from Makoto. Mugo was being refined into something that was unlike despair or hope. And she had no way of knowing where her path would lead. Over ten minutes had passed. The sound of the students leaving the gym and making their way to the nurse's office rang throughout the hall. Just like Jack had continued to dodge Sakura's attacks with her tricky movements. But when Byakuya blurted out, Enough already, you in you irritating pervert. Genocide Jack stopped in her tracks. Oh my my! Getting chewed out. Chewed out by my best spackled Byakuya. It's making my massage, misogynistic side get all tingly. 
narcissistic side. Oh my god, why are we? They say the line between Satan's and masochism is favorite thing, but in my case, it's more like this a big diagram. Or it's explaining these towers of passion swimming from the top of my head to the tips of my toes. As she rambled incoherently about Biakria, <laughs> the other students shot, tied her up with a microphone cable from the gym and locked her in the room, her room. Half the students stayed behind to keep an eye on her, while the rest left to search the grounds of the school. As soon as the doors to the nurse's office opened, Kyoko saw a non-functioning Monokuma with a hole in his chest and the remains of a surveillance camera. It wasn't just the nurse's office, though. On the way there, the students had seen several destroyed surveillance cameras and scattered Monokuma bodies. This was a clear violation of the school regulations, but Mukuro was allied with Monokuma. Those regulations wouldn't apply to her anyways. The Monokuma inside the gym was no longer moving, and the students had lost contact with the hacker. Bashiki Madari. So the students assumed that Madari had taken control of the gym Monokuma and went after Monokuma on his own. Mukuro on his own. With that in mind, Kyoko turned and looked inside the nurse's office again. It was unusually quiet. The beds were empty, but Kyoko could see the bloodshed things that someone had been resting in there recently. It looks like they're already gone. Ugh, looks like they're already gone, Mondo remarked. But as he was about to leave, Kyoko spoke up behind him. I'm going to stay here with Chihiro and search for clues. Asked Chihiro, her timid eyes whining. Clues? Kyoko continued to speak in a calm tone of voice. Yes, there may be some clues in these Monokuma raids. I figured you would be the best candidate for rescuing machinery. Yes, Sakura spoke up. But isn't that dangerous? Since Sakura could, since Sakura could clearly hold her own in a fight with Mukuro, she had joined the other students in searching the school grounds. Kyoko stood her, shook her hands in re and replied, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to say, but if things get out of hand, Chihiro and I will you just need your way. I think it's better if we search for clues here instead of doing nothing. Besides, we might be able to use Monokuma's parts to detect any radio broadcasts from the outside world. <laughs> you sound like you have a point. Understood, we'll be exploring this bar for a while. Please shout out for us if anything happens. Sakura left the nurse's office. How did she destroy Monokuma like this? How did she destroy Monokuma like this? As Shihiro cautionally saw over Monokuma's reins, Kyo started searching through the room. She zeroed down one of the beds and began studying intensely. A moment later, Kyoko was satisfied with what she found and had a small sigh before she spoke. Chihiro, let me apologize to you in advance. Huh? I dragged you into this gamble of mine. So if it happens, run out of the hallway and call for help. What? What does this mean? Was that answering Chihiro's question? Kyoko started talking to one of the empty beds. Let me say this first. I'm prepared to hear your story. No matter how ridiculous it makes sense, I promise not to decide if it's a lie or the truth until I've looked into it in its reality. Chihiro looked confused. She didn't understand what Kyoko meant at all. The ultimate question mark, question mark, question mark, lowered her eyes and turned the ultimate program to make a request. Chihiro, does your laptop have a voice recording function? And you also have a microphone. Uh, yeah. I want you to use that to record everything we're about to hear. But there's no one here. As Chihiro wondered to herself, she began connecting Monokuma's parts to her laptop and turned to the on the record function. I'm sure we'll pick up every sound in this room now, said Chihiro nervously. Tasked by Kyoko nodded and once again started talking to the empty bed. So what are, what are you going to do if I told everyone I had found Makoto? When she heard Kyoko say that, Chihiro looked back at her and was surprised by what she saw. At that moment, the alternate program was kneeling on the floor next to Monokuma's remains. In that position, she was able to see it. Of all the beds in the nurse office, there was one bed in particular that she couldn't see from the entrance. Underneath the bed was lay a limp Makoto. A blood pack was hidden with, next to the bed and slowly providing Makoto with a transfusion. The times of the blood pack were clear. Rather than blood, it needed some kind of settling solution using emergency hydration. Though it wouldn't be as effective as an actual blood transfusion, it was enough to keep him from going to shock. Though so that was in the sense she was medical knowledge. She was far already surprised that Makoto had been in the nurse office this whole time. Not only that, but Kyoko wasn't talking to the bed that Makoto was under. She which sent chills throughout Chihiro's body. However, there was nobody under the bed that Kyoko was facing. But the moment that Chihiro noticed this, a voice rang out from underneath it. As soon as everyone's attention was focused on Makoto. As soon as everyone's attention was focused on Makoto, I was trying to take advantage of that opportunity to take, to take someone hostage. And Chihiro cautiously lowered the head until it was nearly touching the floor. She was able to make out who was talking. So I the person hiding there and cling, was clinging to the front of the bed, like a ninja clinging to the ceiling. Zoomingly, it was some one had glanced under the bed quickly. They wouldn't have noticed anyone was there. But Chihiro had no idea the person was hiding under the bed was so long. She could at least understand that their strength was beyond normal human levels. There was no question that the person hiding under the bed was Mukuro Ikusaba. But you were pretending not to notice. Why? Why? 
Mukoi was voice was the cold eyes, but Kyoko didn't even flinch as he responded. Because I wanted to hear your side of the story. I knew you were hiding under that bed. Compared to the others, the frame was slightly more pronounced. Shihiro tried to com comparing the bed to see if this was true, but she couldn't tell the difference at all. Only Kyoko's natural observant skill could t let her see something like that. Mukuro seemed to come to a similar conclusion and appeared from under the bed without making a sound. Her face was still cold. Compared to the bomb design Monokuma, Chihiro thought she was even more terrifying. However, Mukuro ignored Chihiro and shifted her gaze at Kyoko. She leaned against the wall and let her arms fall to her sides as she threw out another question. Why do you want to hear what I have to say? Kyoko thought about this simple question for a while, as if she was searching within her own heart for an answer. If I had to provide an answer, it's because I wished... If I have to provide an answer, it's because I wish to remain neutral. Kyoko quietly looked down. I'm currently missing most of my memories. I don't know who I am or what odds I cannot, had to be accepted into the school. She could hear Chihiro gasp behind her, but Kyoko didn't mind and continued. But even so, I believe I should listen to what you have to say. Regardless of whether you're good or evil, I must hear all the facts in order to know the truth. And Zarthoth is getting gassy. Good and evil don't matter. I'll come to a conclusion based on what I see and hear. I think that's the mythology that's been instilled into me. I see. I completely forgot that you were like that, Kyoko. Before I listen to but before I listen to what you have to say, I'd like to ask you one question first. What is it? Mugoro's reply was completely emotionless. Kyoko presented her question as if she was asking it of herself as well. What was my talent that what, what was my talent oh, that allowed me to attend this academy? The answer to that question was simple. Kyoko, you're the ultimate detective. That answer marked a turning point for both girls. Thank you. I have a better understanding of the situation now. Kyoko slowly raised her heads and preserved a th presented a theory. If my memory loss wasn't just a coincidence, then you, no, your group has the ability to erase people's memories. With that in mind, if we take into consideration the situation that rolled in the gym earlier, I can only come to one possibility. Possibility? Yes. What you said to be Akio when he thought you were taking Tokyo hostage. You claim that they met two years ago. It's possible that might actually be true. The fact that Makoto called out Mukuro's name. The, type, the things Mukuro confirmed and denied. It's not like Jack's outlandish claims. These key factors that Kyoko noticed using her special observation skill were converging into her mind that to form one answer. It's possible that Byakuya and Tokyo's memories were also raised. Like mine, I don't think their circumstances are quite the same as mine. But if our memories can be controlled so freely, it calls into question whether the day Monica appeared was really the same day we entered the academy. Like you said, it's possible that we've known Toko Fukawa for the last few years. What, what do you mean? What, what do you mean? Chihiro cried, So what? working on connecting her laptop to Monica's cards. Kyoko continued, speaking to both Chihiro and Mukuro. We thought we were knocked unconscious when sleeping gas the moment we arrived at the school. But it's possible that we were simply made to think that's what happened. For example, we may have already spent the last few years at Homestead Academy, and our memories of the time were completely erased. It's the impossible that we weren't even ultimates at all, just random people who have been implanted with 16 years worth of false memories. Though Kyoko's claim sounded ridiculous, her face was completely serious. She looked at Muku once again, which means, I'm considering the possibility that your crazy suit story is actually true. Kyoko's declaration filled the room with silence. But she did let that silence overwhelm her. Kyoko cut through it with her own words. Without evidence, all I can make is hypotheses. That's why I wanted to hear what you have to say, Mukuro. I have no intention of blindly believing what you were going to say. Or what that self-proclaimed hacker who took over Monokuma said. She paused and lowered her eyes again, then declared with powerful determination. Even so, I intend to come to a conclusion as fairly and objectively as I can. But I can only do that if you trust me and tell me the truth. Kyoku's conviction was clear from her voice. Mukuro eyes narrowed slightly, and a tapestry of emotions flashed across her face as she looked towards Kyoko. But when she opened her mouth, her expression and voice were completely devoid of emotion. That's right, I completely forgot. They were like that. Mukuro repeated this to herself softly, then faced Kyoko and declared, That must be like Junko took care of to erase more of your memories compared to the others. Very well, I'll tell you everything. And after Mukuro placed Makoto back onto the bed, she began to mechanically tell the story. The story of a girl who wanted to fill the world with despair. A girl who only felt truly, ha truly happy when she was filled with despair herself. A plan for despair that began two years ago. Or perhaps even earlier than that. How the world was currently ruled by despair itself. Mukuro provided a brief summary of everything she knew about the plan. That's why it sounded even more outrageous than Kyoko had expected. And though her story, and through her story, Kyoko was able to learn that truth about herself. 
it's who she is she uh, who she is and why she came to the academy the fate of the academy's real headmaster Kyoko's father well we don't get the happy birthday gift as she listened to Mukuro's story Kyoko remained silent the whole the whole time but her face went blank when she learned her father had died perhaps her, or rather murdered in some weird sex chamber in a in a, shut, in a space shuttle it's a weird Monokuma rocket. Perhaps her memory loss and the absurdity of the situation helped lessen the impact somewhat. But there was no guarantee Kyoko would even believe her story. After Mukuro finished speaking, Kyoko stayed silent. With her unrivaled mental prowess, she was able to listen to Mukuro's story without interrupting her or dismissing it as nonsense. Mukuro continued, You don't have to believe me. After all, any pictures picture that could prove my story are with, after all, any pictures that could prove my story are with Junko. All I can do is talk. After she that, Mukuro suddenly walked towards the entrance of the nurse's office. When she arrived at the door, she spoke again without looking back. But even if you don't believe me, you still listen to everything I had to say. So, Kyoko Chihiro, thank you. Of course Chibi would listen. Chibi is a delight! After apologizing in such a strange tone of voice, she turned to the bed where Makoto was lying, breathing weakly. Make sure Makoto stays arrested. When he wakes up, make sure you give him some sports drinks from the dining hall or some... some uh, or supply him to drink. Uh, I'm please... Uh, of course, but what are you going to do now? Asked Kyoko. Mukuro straightened herself up. Despair. I need to. I need to make Junko feel despair. Mukuro continued mumbling to herself as she opened the door. Yes, making Junko feel despair. That's like awarding a rowdy child by giving them a piece of chocolate cake. Or giving them a hug or a pat on the back. There's nothing else I can do. No, there is something you can do. Mukuro stopped walking as Kyoko spoke firmly. Regardless of whether Monokuma is really Junko in Oshima or Bashiki Madari, if you're dealing with him, he won't be able to lay a finger on Makoto. I don't fully trust you, but if you're really concerned for Makoto's life, I'm willing to work with you. Unlike Bashiki, you probably abandoned him already. Right? I'm sorry, I don't really work well with others. You would have been here! Mukuro looked away and bowed her head as she left the nurse's office. But I'm, I'll do my best! The door is closed and Mukuro is gone. I'm sorry for following you with something so dangerous, Chibi. See? Okay, Mukuro, she's alright! She was walking out for Chibi! As she continued to organize the vast amounts of information that Mukuro gave her, Kyoko turned to Chihiro, who was still wondering, working on Monokuma. As she trembled with fear, Chihiro slowly looked back at Kyoko. Um, Kyoko? About what Mukuro said just now. Chihiro's face turned pale as she struggled with her words, but then Kyoko tried to calm her down. You can't determine if anything she told us was true or not. There's no need to be afraid. But Chihiro shook his head when he looked at Blaka. I think she was telling the truth. I'm sorry if I said it once. Why are you basing that on? Um, well, it looks like Monokuma is really being controlled from the outside. Part of Monokuma's system had been connected to Shiro's laptop, and she was analyzing the day within its control system. And it was then that the ultimate programmer knows something unusual about it. This control program? I thought it would be another year before the system became fully optional. She just started trembling so much that she was unable to continue speaking. We can't confirm, we can't confirm that, said Kyoko, proposing another possibility to avoid jumping to conclusions. It's possible that a similar program was being developed in secret. But Chihiro admittedly shook her head and said, No, that's not it. It just looks really familiar to me. Kyoko looked over to Chihiro's trembling shoulders to peer at the screen, and that's when she noticed. This program. Chihiro. This program? Chihiro, did you create this? All the ultimate programmer could do was now be free. First floor, main hall. Mukuro continued moving forward and was fortunate enough not to carry Sakura or Mondo. I'm pretty sure she could kick Mondo's ass. I mean, sure. Oh, yeah, because really, what, what strength have we seen from Mondo? He threw Monokuma, he punched Makoto, and he killed Chibi. I mean, really, killing Chibi is like killing a pillow. It's not some massive accomplishment. With no interference from anyone, she made her way to the, law, to the hall as large as the gym and stood before the sealed main entrance. Suddenly, Monokuma popped out from the shadows to block her path. Within the hall that resembled a nuclear bomb shelter, replete, replete with all manner of heavy weaponry, Monokuma Silas was in conspicuous out of place there, his laughter riding out throughout the room as he wiggled his body from side to side. <laughs> what are you, what are you going to do at the nurse's office? Did you eliminate your rival from Makoto's affections? Or did you help play matchmaker instead? Either way, don't you think it's Bob's kind of adorable to put Makoto and Kyoko in this kind of situation together? 
If this were suspenseful, those two would be in the last couple standing. But if this was a horror film, they'd just die anyways. The killer was a lot. The killer was all alive all along. Black goes the blood, black goes the meat. I'm a huge fan of endings where the characters think they're gonna live, but then they're really heading to a final destination. I'm sorry if my voice is getting off. I'm gonna need to get beverage after this. Wait, what the hell? Wait, what the hell is a tenation? What does that even mean? Despite Monokuma's anger to bite, Mukuro remained unperturbed. She continued to send icy daggers at Monokuma. As, she, as if she was waiting for him to finish speaking. <laughs> well, anyways, I'm just so sad right now. A regular breaking the liquid is disrupting the harmony of the Seasonal Academy. I can't even keep one of my students from running wild. Time to say goodbye to your incompetent headmaster. I could use Monokuma's evolution to become a big ma magnum headmaster and mold you into a decent student. As soon as he said that, Monokuma exited the stage and walked towards Mukuro. So I'm gonna mold you, then I gotta kill you first! Right as he finished speaking, Monokuma suddenly charged at Mukuro like a spiked volleyball. But Mukuro was faster and dodged Monokuma's attack. She jumped back to your distance from Monokuma just in case his claws could extend even longer. Just then, a shadowy figure appeared next to her. Mukuro twisted her body to its limits and just narrowly evaded the figure's attack. Sakura! She landed before she immediately saw. Does the immortal killer want anyways? Are you gonna tell the eyes the truth escape with them? Even though you want even though you know what the outside world is like right now? Two Monikumas were speaking to Mukuro in unison. Honestly, I don't mind if you do that. I can just imagine the look on everyone's face when they discover the truth. It fills me with such heart throbbing excitement. The two Monikumas continue to speak in stereo sound. You said you destroyed my plans, but there's no happy ending waiting for you, no matter which route you take. And you only have yourself to blame for that. Don't tell me you thought they'd be grateful to you. Either you guys escape here, do you think they'll still forgive you for what when they get a whiff of that nasty air outside? Some of them might prefer staying in the school, and some of them might resent you for being kind and showing them the truth. But then again, this is all your fault anyway, so it doesn't really matter what they think of you. Monokuma, Monokuma made a little mistake. Despite facing down two Monokuma, despite facing down two Monokuma, Mukuro's expression didn't waver. She understood that controlling two Monokuma simultaneously was a piece of cake with Junko. Mukuro drew an arm flanked metal bar from seemingly out of nowhere and raised herself. It was the remains of the IV stand from the nurse's office, sharpened to a pointed weapon. With her weapon in hand, Mukuro responded in a cold mechanical tone. That's that's fine. I'm already used to that. None of the fear she felt when Monokuma suggested that Mukuro. Makoto would blame her appear on her face. Her past was clear to her now, and she calmly issued her demand to Monokuma. Junko, open the gates! The shock of such straightforward demand from both Monokuma's momentarily solutions, but they soon replied, Huh? Why? So we can all leave together? Another straightforward answer. Both Monokuma's faced each other and began gesturing as they whispered to one another. Mukuro knew their movements were intended to mock her. Unmoved, she continued to speak to Junko directly. I think they'll understand if we show them the outside world, and think they'll stop dying, Makoto. I think they'll start dying. I understand if I show them the outside world, and they'll stop dying, Makoto. You always find new ways to disappoint me, Mukuro. Did you forget why the school is an air filtration system? It's true that the air outside is fluid, but I don't think it'll kill us immediately. Besides, it's better than being trapped in the school and forced to kill each other. How can you be so sure the others will go along with you? You know what I mean, right? Before the hor before the former headmaster got turned to space dust, he interviewed the others and they all agreed that they wanted to stay in the school. That was before their memories had even been erased. Do you really want to betray their wishes? Mukuro blinked and slowly stepped forward. I don't really care about their feelings. Huh? You're all I need, Junko. So don't worry, I'm always watching out for you. I'm going to make you sure you feel despair and I'm going to make Makoto and the others happy. If you want to revel in your own despair that badly, then I'll trust the hope Makoto gave me and take my chances with them instead of you. I'm sorry if my Junko's voice has like a nasally guy voice. It's just this reading is doing a number on me. Junko's brief but powerless words caused the Monokumas to turn and talk to each other again. Oh my! This doesn't look at all, Monokuma, eh? This child doesn't realize her own hypocrisy. She dodges a boy and she's starting to reach critical mass, right, Monokuma B? The two Monokumas looked at Mukuro, who seemed ready to destroy them, and said, What do you think, Monokuma-see? Mukuro was taken back by their question. 
but her instinct suddenly kicked in and she immediately dodged away. At that moment, a third Monokuma, cause extended, passed by where her head was had been previously. This new Monokuma unit landed with several spins and faced Mugro, where it clung to the remains of the surveillance cam was still attached to the ceiling. I agree with you both, A and B! The three Monokumas lined themselves up. Just to the stairs locked away in this academy, that sight would have been akin to a nightmare! Ah, oh, sorry. To the students inside the academy, this sight would have been akin to a, to a nightmare. I am so sorry about that. Right on! <laughs> the three years began speaking in perfect harmony as the six eyes locked up, looked up to a new growth. Suddenly, they each jumped away in three separate directions and kicked off on the wall. Past the each year's tiny go attack, all converged on a single point. Mukuro, who was clinging to the ceiling. She was surrounded by razor sharp claws coming at her from different directions. But this situation wasn't even a nightmare of Mukuro. The better the time she fended off three assassins who had invaded her camp one night back when she was still a member of Fenrir, this was nothing. This thought crossed Mukuro's mind as she dangled from the ceiling with one hand and thrashed her limbs around like a tornado. As she by this move, the monocle was fell to the floor with a loud crash. Mukuro landed on the ground and chased after one of them, brandishing the metal ball. Only she is not moving and took a huge step back. One of the Monokumas exploded with a deafening roar and had detonated the bomb inside of himself in an attempt to take Mukuro down with him. But thanks to her whole battlefield instinct, Mukuro managed to avoid this explosion. She looked towards the hallway, expecting the explosion to have attracted the, near the attention of Zakara and the others, but she didn't hear any footsteps approaching. Monokuma's voice rang from within the dense smoke. Oh, you don't have to worry! I already told the other students to assemble at the cafeteria! They were eager to follow my orders after I told them I disarmed the poison gas, and the special police unit was coming to get them! I'm pretty sure Kiyoko and the others are all in the cafeteria by now! I'm sure Makoto is with them too! I doubt Sakura will get too rough with him, but I'm sure Biaku will torture Makoto once he wakes up! Yes, Biaku, he's gonna slap Makoto around with a lot of money! Wake up, you cur! I am Biaku Yotogami. I can do whatever I want with my money. He slips a, do a, a big wild a thousand dollar, a thousand one dollar bills out of his sleeve and just starts slapping Makoto with it. I can imagine him rubbing salt and pouring soy sauce into his open wounds. Man, I'm getting whole hot and bothered right now. Yes. Oh my gosh. I can just imagine <laughs> Biaku you're taking one of those. You know those little packets of salt that you find at restaurants? I can just imagine taking one of those and slowly pouring in Makoto's wounds. As she listened to Monokuma's overlapping voices, Mukuro tilted her head slightly and asked, I'm pretty sure they're gonna find out that you lied about that special police unit. Are you really okay with that? You don't worry! Once I dealt with you, I don't get it all save my dad was lying! <laughs> you still don't get it! You're such a disappointment! It's only Donna Mukuro. Not the reason why Monokuma didn't care if the students found out he lied. Rather, that the voice of the Monokumas in the smoke were gradually increasing in number. As the smoke started clear, the shadows of three Monokumas appeared. One that exploded couldn't have been revived, so a new one must have come to take its place. But there was no way Mukuro heard three Monokumas talking just now. But the proof of hearing had been accurate, the Monokumas suddenly made their move. The three Monokumas bent over and began twirling their upper bodies from the net. Behind them, a new Monokuma emerged, like after images brought to life. The second row of Monokumas mimicked the earlier ones with only one frame of delay, revealing even more Monokumas behind them. Eventually, Mu Mu Mukuro revealed that there were th was that there were three rows getting ten Monokumas each. Thirty Monokumas! <laughs> Did you know this is called a circle dance? Monokumas' thirty voices spoke in perfect harmony as they divulged information that had nothing to do with the current situation. Mukuro, Mukuro already knew that mon multiple Monokumas were positioned throughout the academy, but only Junko knew how many Monokumas actually existed. Mukuro had no way of knowing if these thirty Monokumas were part of a larger contingent. The flock of two-toned teddy bears continued to twirl around. Mukuro felt like she was being bombarded with hypnotic images. But faced with this uh, uh, no, like the ultimate soldier remained calm and maintained her focus. She was nothing like the girl who had panicked early in the gym when Makoto was impaled. As she stood before 30 em emissaries of despair, she slowed her breathing and allowed her heart rate to accelerate. It was instinct, not pure panic, that sent her blood racing through her throughout her body, speeding up her the reaction time of her cells. At her senses sharpened, the Monokumas began speaking to her again. Don't worry, I'll make sure Makoto doesn't die! I'll make him watch you die! As long as everyone lives, I can reset their memories as many times as I want! <laughs> That's right! All your efforts, hopes and dreams, and determination are going right in the garbage heap! Now Makoto took turns speaking to the, in groups of ten, as if the mastermind controlling the Monokumas wanted to show up her ability to manipulate them. However, the ultimate soldier knew what the true purpose behind this was. She strained her ears to their limit and noticed a certain sound 
hearing the Monokuma's voices. Muko's face remained perfectly still as she kicked off the floor. The moment she moved to the side, a roaring sound struck the entrance hall. The ceiling mat turrets in front of the gate started raining bullets down Mukuro. The Monokumas were just the mastermind's decoys while she tried to blow her away. As if further trapping her, the Monokumas charged at Mukuro through the storm of bullets. Mukuro guessed that the mastermind would program their movements in advance so they wouldn't get by a single bullet. She ran for the gates, evading waves of bullets and claws every step of the way, programming 30 Monokumas in two turrets while also protecting Mukuro's escape, predicting Mukuro's escape. This would be considerably impossible for anyone, but Mukuro knew it was impossible. It was possible for Junko. As ultimate despair, she possessed despair-inducing abilities that surpassed the capabilities of any normal human. Her display of power was only for filling Mukuro with despair. Despair. The scene playing out in front of Mukuro was brimming with despair. The adorably deadly Monokumas laughed and danced like weepers as bullets whizzed throughout the air. It was despair to the point of absurdity, and it was all for Mukuro. But in the pretense of such despair, Mukuro felt a strange serenity. For me. Junko's doing this all for me. Junko, are you watching me right now? Of course Junko's watching you right now! Junko has her ways! In the end, perhaps Mukuro really was not disappointment. She clenched her fists. Junko, thank you. The sound of gunfire overshadowed her whispers, and Mukuro felt completely silent. As a member of Ultimate Despair, Mukuro's heart was filled with joy. Though she was filled with emotion, her eyes had lost their sparkle. Times for the air, even the gunfire from the turret seemed to stop for a moment. But that was only an allusion to one, the one controlling Monokuma. Something strong enough to silence the gunfire and avoid being picked up by the sensors spread throughout the school, with Mukuro at its center. I'll make sure I do this right! With that final thought, she closed her mouth and turned off her emotions. She ran through the waves of scorching bullets. The air around her began to grow colder. As this coolness spread to, into her heart, it began to be in a mechanical function. Several seconds later, Mukuro's body and mind melded together and became more with her surroundings. Her temperature now dominated the battlefield. Despair fought and Monokumas filled the area. Mukuro predicted their movements and jumped into the air without any hesitation. One of the Monokumas jumped at her, but she avoided his attack, kicked his body, and launched herself into midair. Bullets pierced through the space Mukuro was previously occupying, striking the falling Monokuma right through its internal bomb. The impact of the bullet caused it to explode, sending fiery Monokuma hearts flying everywhere. As she rode the blast wave, Mukuro balanced herself in midair as she kicked away two, three Monokumas that leapt after her. She managed to move so gracefully, gracefully she was practically flying. In contrast, the Monokumas threw themselves into the path of oncoming bullets, exploding one after another. Some of them exploded near the main entrance, but the blast didn't even leave a scratch. With full control over the entrance hall, Mukuro invaded bullets and confirmed that the bombs inside the Monokumas were enough to destroy the door. But she refused to stop. Mukuro needed the information on what she must do to escape the academy. She had no desire to kill Junko. Mukuro wanted to fill Junko with despair by instilling hope into the future of Makoto and the other students. And that was Mukuro's ultimate goal, get information. In contrast to her determination, her mouth stayed shut. But this did not mean Mukuro was not currently speaking to Junko. This situation, this battle of death and destruction was a conversation of sorts for Mukuro. All she knew how to do was fight. She thought she wasn't interested in anything else. She thought she didn't need anything else. All Mukuro needed to be was a sword to fulfill her sister's desire for despair. That purpose alone was the crux of her existence, and she lived her entire life convincing herself that she couldn't do anything else. That's why power was like a language to Mukuro. A bow to the death revealed more about her heart than mere words ever could. Her words were in the wind of savagery that blows across the battlefield, uprooting others who also speak the language of violence. This was the true this was true even against her sister. When Junko would berate her sister, Mukuro couldn't talk back. All she could do was cower and apologize profusely. But it's different now. For the first time, Junko was using a language her sister actually recognized. The child of despair who tore the world apart was speaking to her sister with the language of power. Mukuro's heart was full of joy. For that reason, she strengthened her focus on conversation with Junko. And that emotion began to gradually disappear. On this frigid battlefield, Mukuro continued her heat, co heat conversation. Endless rounds of despair fired from his cool turrets, but Mukuro's words inter intercepted every last violent shot that threatened to shatter her body and her mind in half. She quickly realized that the Monokumas hadn't decreased in number at all, no matter how many she kept destroyed. Not only that, she noticed that the Monokumas had been joined the fray until there were nearly 50 of them for M Mukuro to fight. But Mukuro's resolve wouldn't break so easily. As she continued to wield her power, her heart began to fill with something that was neither hope nor despair. She learned despair from being abandoned by Junko, and she learned hope from her acts of violence. For Mukuro, who had no interest in this world, this small space in front of the gate was a reflection of her life, 
a, represent a representation of her perfect world. This disappointing girl, filled with endless disappointment, who knew of no other way to live, continued her lonely dance. She surrendered herself to the rhythm of despair, which accompanies the music of hope. Com the, the computer's innermost area, Monokuma's room. How much time has passed? The surveillance cameras at the gate were capturing footage of countless Monokumas falling at the hands of a child who fought like a raging demon. The Monokumas bolstered their numbers, and now 100 of them were trying to sink their claws into Mukuro. Most of them were running on Isle of Pilot, reacting to her movement based on prior information they had received in advance. But despite standing before hundreds of mechanical adversaries, Mukuro's face showed no fear. She hadn't sustained a single injury, giving her a presence that was nearly divine to behold. Though Sakura Ogami was powerful enough to injure her arm, Mukuro in her current state could potentially fight Sakura to a draw now, while relying on firearms. She took complete control of the battlefield, taking in herself, taking in her signs as if they were part of herself. She dodged attacks from the rear as though she had eyes on the back of her head, and stabbed through Monokuma's weak points with her metal bar. See? I'm starting to, I'm starting to dig, the, dig the Mukuro Makoto ship. I mean, really. I like the... I like the... 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 Ah, uh, sorry. I'm, I'm, the, I'm sorry. The Nagiri ship. I'm gonna say Nagiri ship because that's the official name. And not the Miyoko ship? Yeah, ah, that's it, Miyoko! But yeah, anyways, the thing is, Kyoko, she was the one to throw Makoto under the bus! Meanwhile, that. She's all that happened. Jugo, Mukuro were probably flipping. We're probably flipping the bird off to Kyoko. Now, where are the attacks came from? Mukuro deflected them all as if her skin were covered, were covered in eyes. Describing her as ultimate no longer did her justice, Mukuro had just transcended the boundaries of humanity and becoming a pure killing machine. But despite that, even though she understood the ludicrous power her sister possessed, Junko was not afraid. She felt not one iota of fear. After all, Junko could still feel despair. She st even started to admire her sister's attempt to fill her with despair, but that sentiment quickly filled Junko with an orge orgiastic ecstasy of despair. Junko knew. She knew that Mukuro was neither hope nor despair. She was just a phenomenon. A disappointing girl who no longer understood herself, who only knew how to be violent because it was all she could believe in anymore. Mukuro had become an avatar of destruction beyond that of any military force. She couldn't even be considered a soldier anymore. She was a natural disaster, like a typhoon or a tornado. Or perhaps, like gravity, she was now a fundamental force of the universe that only existed to bring despair to Junko. The mastermind enjoyed watching her sister go all out. If Mukuro destroyed everything and ruined her life, Junko would still be com comforted by the despair. She could just go right ahead and overpower her. Junko considered this for a few seconds until a familiar hopeless habit reared its head. Her habit of getting so bored that it made her sick. The girl who had been grinning as she watched the screen now bore a look of calm stoicism as she reached for the microphone connected to the Monokuma speakers. Mukuro was no longer human anymore, but Junko knew how to bring her back. It was a simple feeling, really. And with that hopeless feeling removed from her mind, the master line said just one word. Mukuro. And for the main entrance. Mukuro, that voice. It was calling her name. The deputy Monokuma's voice was the Junko's natural voice was coming out of the Monokuma unit. That's all it took. With one word, Mukuro Ikusaba stopped being a force of nature and became a person again. Monokuma would not miss this opportunity. As if moving to the beat of Mukuro's shaking heart, a torrent of claws left to attack her. But Mukuro trusted her instinct and twisted her entire body to fend off the attack, leaving her with only a few scrapes here and there. But the despair wasn't over yet. The ultimate despair didn't waste any time making her next move. Mu Mukuro, watch out! Huh? As soon as Mukuro heard that voice, her mind went completely blank. There's no mistaking it, that was Mokoto's scream. That scream that saved her from the spheres of Gunyar and changed her destiny. No, that's wrong! It took her to realize that voice was just a sound clip that Junko had been played, but it was more than enough time to drive Mukuro, who had regained her humanity, into despair. Right when she recovered from her moment of shock, Monokuma appeared behind her and around his kicked her into the temple. She twisted her head to a roll with the blow, but at that moment, a different Monokuma attacked her from the outside with a head bust. And as soon as Mukuro dodged the attack, three Monokumas launched Dominatus dropkicks and knocked her to the ground. Ah. The fact that they weren't using their claws meant they were trying to kill Mukuro right away. Or she could stay up against dozens of Monokumas waiting for her on the floor, climbed on top of Monok Mukuro and pinned her limbs. One of the Monokumas wallowed to Mukuro as she lay face down on the floor and laughed. A pretty girl being pinned down by all these memes! I wonder if I should feel more excited about this! Don't make- don't make that face! If I wanted to kill you, I'd just pump you full of bullets right now! 
Well, I don't think the audience watching this on TV would enjoy that fair ending very much. I need to make sure I do this the right way this time. What are you planning to do to me? Bukharas, in her emotionless voice, Monica McGoffin answered. Nothing, I'm just gonna stick to the original plan and make you play the killing game at this school. I'll erase everyone's memories again, and I'll just make them redo the introduction and entry ceremony again. In typical Monica fashion, he leaned his face towards Mukuro. But it'd be boring if we had to redo everything. Maybe this time, I'll have you participate in Mukuru Ikusaba. I'll delete like even more of your memories like I did to that irritating detective girl. You'll just be a poor little girl with no memories at all. As Monica talked and wiggled his body from side to side, the other Monokumas danced and twirled around. Amid this fantastical scene, Monokuma continued to describe his hopeless plan in a nonsense chalk matter. At first, you'll be a girl with amnesia, and everyone will feel sorry for you. Past that, you unravel the mysteries of this academy, they'll find out who you really are. It's exciting to think how they'll treat you when that happens. Knowing you, you'll probably kill someone purely out of instinct. Maybe I should rethink my rules about self-defense. <laughs> you can't. Her memories will be erased. There was nothing she could do about her classmates hating her, but losing even her childhood memories would mean her connection to Junko would be severed as well. Even Mukuro had no interest in the world. That was unbearable even for her. I've heard of New Game Plus before, but this is the first time I'll, I'll get to see a game, New Game Minus. <laughs> should I tie you up for fun? Or maybe we should take this game even more masochistic. Forget hard mode, very hard mode, and inferno mode. Want to skip ahead to impossible mode? Maybe I'll raise your memories after I drag you on a motorcycle, pummeling you with a thousand baseballs, burn you at the stake, and crush you with an excavator! All the punishments! Mukuro knew that Monokuma, what Monokuma was talking about. He was describing the tools they had prepared for the various executions they had planned for the student. So, wait, what, what? Time out, time out! So, did Mukuro and Jugo just sit down at a table one day, and they just were brainstorming punishments? Was Ju was Mukuro like, okay, okay, here's what I'm thinking. You're yeah, Leon kid, if he if he kills someone, well, let's just pump him with basil. You go, oh, good one, good one. Sorry. After everyone reintroduces themselves, they'll walk around the school grounds and eventually find a flat-chested girl with amnesia. Covered in badges with Ben Nears tattoo on her right hand. I bet a certain fan base might get onto that. If this were a game, that would increase sales like 500%. No, Monokuma sounded like he was joking. Everything he said was deadly serious. As evidence, Mukuro heard a rumbling sound off in the distance. Now then, your sweet ride's on its way! Based on the engine's noise, Mukuro surmised that it was the large motorcycle that was supposed to be used for one of the executions. I took the time to bring this all the way from the pressure room, so you better be grateful! The sound of the roaring engine grew louder and louder, like the approaching footsteps of death. Mukuro wondered how Monokuma would drive it, with such tiny arms and legs, but then she remembered she was dealing with an ultimate despair. Junko would make the impossible possible just to bring about despair. A despair that went hand in hand with Mukuro's fate. Did I fail? I couldn't fill Junko with despair. I couldn't save Makoto and the others. Questions raised through Mukuro's mind, but she was able to answer them. There was no way she could have answered them so easily. After all, she was still alive. The sound of the motorcycle grew closer and closer, as if it was threatening to break Mukuro's spirits. Suddenly, Monokuma stopped moving. The other Monokumas continued doing their automatic movements. As the strange event unfolded, Mukuro noticed something. Their motorcycle had suddenly gone quiet. After a few seconds, the engine exploded to life and began to approach even faster than before. Only a few seconds later, what appeared in front of the main entrance was an enormous motorcycle that plowed through the groups of Monokuma was like a predator hunting his prey. The rider of his motorcycle was other than Mondo Awada. Mukuro and Monokuma were both visibly shocked by this turn of events. Instead of addressing them, Mondo accelerated the motorcycle he stole from Monokuma directly towards Mukuro. Just before his front tire touched Mukuro, he popped a reverse wheelie and turned the entire motorcycle around. The back wheel swept around Mukuro's back, knocking away the Monokumas that were pinned here. Hey, can you stand? Mondo asked, and begrudgingly offered his hand to Mukuro. Confused, Mukuro took his hand and stood up. What are you, what are you doing, Mondo? I was so close. What are you doing, Mondo? I was so close! One of the Monokumas protested. Not his normal voice, but as the hacker. Then she cut my Dari. Oh yeah, you're Big Dari or whatever, right? That's right! That's right! Why are you having a terrorist? I... I... bragging about this or anything, but I have no clue if... Mm, oh, this girl's lying! The raised his temple began to bolt, and his cheeks flared with anger as Monica said, But still, I didn't have the time to stand around and welcome any gang to want a girl! What are you saying? Get hold of yourself! You want to see through your syndrome! You have to lose yourself to think you're better the criminal saying you hostage! Monica tried to explain to Mondo, but he ignored him and took Mukuro's hand and pulled her onto the back of his motorcycle. Oh, shut the F up! I don't know nothing about Stockholm's or Syndrome's, but don't go acting like you can boss me around. 
A spotter shot. He reversed his motorcycle as he was using the puncture wave work. The ceiling mounted turrets began moving, but the two disappeared before the turrets could take aim with the motorcycle. As Mondo shouted, he grabbed the motorcycle as it was as if he was using it to punctuate. Okay. Okay. Again, but the two disappeared before, as they zoomed through the hallway. Callus Monaco was chased after them, waving their claws widely through the air. And with that, we will continue this in the we'll continue this cool story that's pretty riveting in the next episode. I really appreciate that you stuck you stuck around to listen to this. Video, you're a great viewer, and I hope you come back for the next one. If you like to be a like, subscribe, comment, share, do whatever that you want, and with that, I'll see you later. Bye!